All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are watching this, if you're on YouTube and you keep coming back, like and subscribe. Don't not do it. And um, we're glad you're here. We'd love to have you join us in person as well. So everybody, good morning. Um, let's start. And uh, I already gave everybody a little bit of a preview here, but let's just turn to chapter one in the book of Esther and start reading. Can you guys see my screen? All right, very good. So Esther chapter one, the banquets of the king. Now it took place in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was at the citadel in Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his princes and attendants, the army officers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the <clears throat> princes of his provinces being in his presence. And he displayed the riches of his glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days, half a year, he was displaying his glory. When these days were completed, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days for all the people who were present at the citadel in Susa, from the greatest to the least in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were hangings of fine white and violet linen held by cords of fine purple linen on silver rings and marble columns and couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. <laughs> Drinks were served in golden vessels of various kinds, and the royal wine was plentiful according to the king's bounty. The drinking was done according to the law. There was no compulsion, for so the king had given orders to each official of his household that he should do according to the desires of each person. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the palace, which belonged to King Hazarus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehiman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abigtha, Zether, Zether, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Hazarus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes, for she was beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs, and then the king became very angry and his wrath burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for it was the custom of the king, so to speak, before all who knew law and justice, and were close to him, Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marsena, and Mamukin, the seven princes of Persia and Medea who had access to the king's presence and sat in the first place in the kingdom, according to the law, what should be done with Queen Vashti because she did not obey the command of King Hazarus delivered by the eunuchs? In the presence of the king and the princes, Manukin said, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also all the princes and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. <laughs> but the queen's conduct will be known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands by saying, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought to his presence, but she did not come. This day, the ladies of Persia and Medea, who have heard of the queen's conduct, will speak in the same way to all the king's princes, and there will be plenty of contempt and anger. If it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Medea so that it cannot be repealed that Vashti may no longer be in the presence of King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. When the king's edict, <clears throat> which will be made, which we will make, hang on, when the king's, king's edict, which we will make is heard throughout all his kingdom, great as it is, then all the women will give honor to their husbands, great and small. This word pleased the king and the princes and the king <laughs> did as Mamukin proposed. So he sent letters to all the king's provinces and each province according to its script to, <clears throat> and to every people according to, learn, to, learn, to their language, that every man should be the master in his own house and the one who speaks in the language of his own people. <laughs> uh, so interesting stuff here. I'm just gonna give a bit of commentary as we read through this. Um, you know, we're just kind of establishing the backdrop here. So this, this king is very massively powerful, wealthy, and um, has a lot of influence, right? Like, oh my gosh, the, the layout of this place, aside from, you know, the hanging linens, everything here is just crazy expensive today still, to, you know, besides the fabric, everything else here is just ridiculously 
um, fancy, even, even by today's standards. And um, I just find it interesting as well. Now we'll, we'll, we're, we're establishing the backdrop again, right? Because we have this uh, mention of how, you know, if, if we set the law, it cannot be repealed. So we're getting that kind of foreshadowing going on here of this is how things work in this kingdom and this is the rules in this, in this time in history in this place. And then we get, a, we get a sneak preview, right? Because there's always some sort of messed up social system going on in some place in the world, right? And, and this is just an encouragement to us because I know we live in a time where there has been radical feminism and transgenderism and these things that have kind of infected society and are doing harm, right? And, but if we look back, we can see the reversal, right? Like there's, a, there is actually kind of a bit of a male chauvinist moralism going on here where it's like, you know, um, for those of us that are more on the, the libertarian spectrum, we, we can make our critiques about trying to um, uh, legislate morality. And, and here we have an, an example of that going on right now, where it's like, verse 20, when the king's edict, which he will make, is heard throughout all the kingdom, great as it is, then all the women will give honor to their husbands, great and small. So yes, basically, you could just make an edict, and there will never be any divorce, there will never be any, uh, you know, fighting between husband and wife, the, the wife will just always give honor to the man and never, never disrespect or disobey anything they ever say. We'll just have complete subservience because you've made a law. <laughs> Clearly not going to happen. And, um, and so it's just interesting to see how, you know, there's where there is, there's power and there is the ability to make rules. There is um, people using that power foolishly. Um, and so this, you know, this is a time long ago, but it still has similar human problems that we deal with just in different ways today. And so keep some of these things in mind as we go through. Um, it's setting the stage, so let's carry on. Um, hang on, did someone chat something? Yeah, there was no women's lib back then. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by lib, Dean, but yes. Anyway, so Vashti's successor is sought, chapter two. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the citadel of Susa, to the harem, into the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given them. Then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Vashti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. Now there was a, at the citadel in Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jared, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been taken in exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been exiled with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now the young lady was beautiful in form and face, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Interesting stuff, we'll come back to that. <clears throat> so it came about when the command and decree of the king was heard and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa into the custody of Haggai, <clears throat> of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace in the custody of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him, so he prickly provided her with cosmetics and food, gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace, and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Every day Mordecai walked back and forth in the front of the court of the harem to learn how Hester was and how she fared. Now when each, sorry, now on the turn of each young lady came to go into the king Hazarus, into King Azraz, after the end of the 12 months of the regulations for the women, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows, six months of oil and myrrh and six months of spices and cosmetics for women, the young lady would go into the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given to her to take with her from the heron to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in and in the morning, she would return to the second harem. 
to the custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines, she would not again go into the king unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. Now in the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to go into the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Hazarus to his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for the, prince, for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. When the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai has co had commanded her, for Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done when under his care. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's officials from those who guarded the door, became angry and sought to lay hands on the king, on King Hazarus. But the plot became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Now, when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles of the King's Presence. So, interesting little development there. And I just wanted to highlight that, um, you know, those of us, you know, if you've read the book of Esther, you know a lot of cool stuff happens. You know, it's a very interesting story of, of justice kind of coming about. But it's good to remember that Esther was a person who had experienced major trauma, right? Um, you know, she's among the Jews who are in exile. Uh, you can assume that there was a non-peaceful past that they had all experienced to some degree. And here she is, uh, an orphan who's been taken in by her, um, her, oh, I've got this in reverse and it's hard to explain, but basically um, it's like they are cousins, but Mordecai is older as, as far as I understand it. So she's taken, he's taken her on as his daughter. And so this is a, this is a pretty, you know, kind of survival situation. Like if we were to transmute this into today's age, this would be someone in a struggle-ish kind of situation, trying to make ends meet, making the best of a bad situation, taking care of each other kind of thing, right? And so she doesn't live with her mom and dad, they're dead. And that's a tragedy, right? And so she's, you know, you can assume she's experienced some sadness to some degree. Um, I suppose it's possible they died when she was six months old or something and she doesn't remember them, but we don't know. But we all know that um, it is not an advantage to be without two parents, mother and father, all these things. So, you know, she has not had the perfect childhood, so to speak. And um, then we get into this realm and it's like, just, just picture this right now. It's so, it's so interesting to, we can easily just read through this as history and just go, okay, that happened, that happened, that happened. And not really think it through as if, what would it be like to live in that era? And so she's, a, she's an orphan, she's experienced tragedy. And then her lot in life is she is chosen. Um, and, and I'm not gonna speculate and know exactly what all this process is, but it's very possible that, because uh, it said um, at one point here that they would go in in the evening and come out in the morning. So who's to know what that means with regards to the king testing if he likes these women and they're all virgins and they're all young and beautiful and who knows how old he is and if he's a desirable man, but it's like the most powerful dude in the whole area. He's, you know, kind of uh, likes to show off his stuff. And could you imagine like, say, say in, in Europe, there's over the whole kind of realm. And then a call comes by law that every super gorgeous woman who's a virgin, you know, so someone probably in their late teens to early twenties 
is going to get taken off and groomed to see if they're fit to become the queen. And the test is probably they get to be all beautified with makeup and everything, you know, do some sort of Kim Kardashian treatment so that they can go and see the king. And then he's going to decide by the bed, maybe that which which one is, is his favorite. Doesn't really sound like uh, what I would imagine every girl's dream is for how to determine who their husband's going to be. And so it's just this sort of, sort of stuff. It's just not not awesome for Esther, I would imagine, you know. So, you know, more stuff there. But really interesting thing here is that Mordecai through Esther is able to get in the good books of the king, essentially, because he helps prevent this bad thing from happening. And this is another thing to consider, like, we don't have a lot of information, but it's probably safe to say this king is not a perfect guy, not someone who everybody who is under his rule loves or thinks he's great, you know what I mean? And we all know what that's like, right? For those of us um, that are not a fan of Joe Biden, for various reasons, um, whether you like to Trump or didn't like Trump or like the other team or don't like the other team, these leaders who end up in power, they're not always great or even fractionally great. And so maybe Mordecai and part of him was like, well, do I really care if, <laughs> if this king gets killed and somebody else is put in charge? Who knows, right? But, but he did the right thing in helping the king and we'll see how that all plays out. So chapter three. Haman's plot against the Jews. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. So it does appear here, I'm going to interrupt, that Mordecai is some sort of official in some sense because he's in the he's at the king's gate so he has does some sort of work there because it says but mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage then the king's servants who are at the king's gate said to mordecai why are you transgressing the king's command now it was when they spoke daily to him and he would not listen to them that they told haman to see whether mordecai's reason would stand for he had told them that he was a jew so i'm assuming i don't bow down to men i, I only worship one person that's god when Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So, you know, it's possible either Mordecai was among the, you know, princely people to some realm that needed to bow down, or maybe the, the command of the king was that if, if anyone sees Haman, which is quite possible, maybe more likely, anyone in the whole kingdom sees Haman, they need to bow down to him because he's so special. <laughs> and Mordecai was not, not a fan of that. So in the first month, which was the month Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, that is the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the 12th month, that is the month Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered. So I'm assuming this is some sort of... Um, method by which they uh, can determine, you know, who, who gets to ask some sort of law or thing be done for them is just casting the lots. It's like, you know, it's just another indication that this is not really necessarily a just system of government. It's just by random chance, somebody gets to make a rule according to their desire. I, I don't know, um, just speculating there to some degree, but Anyway, so the, the lot falls on Haman, and then he gets to make a request, right? This is this, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the print prop, among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. You can see the uh, persuasion in, intent coming on here. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hand of those who carry <clears throat> on the king's business to put it in the king's treasuries. So basically, you know, he makes his argument, you know, there's these people who don't obey your laws, therefore automatically bad. They're, they're troublemakers, rebels, right? And so it's probably not going to work out well. They're going to cause trouble if they're left around. So why don't we just have them all killed? And, um, and you know, I know that sounds kind of extreme, but I'll put 10,000 talents of silver in your treasury if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so this just again highlights, is this a just king and is this a just system? No, it's just com completely by whim, right? The king is convinced by, without any sort of investigation of, do these people cause trouble? Are they productive members of society? Are they, you know, like important people creating important value in, in all these kingdoms? None of that is, is, is uh, you know, looked at. It's just, he takes Haman's word that they're disobedient, rebellious people. And then the offer of money is enough to just seal the deal. Yeah, 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 let's, let's sign an order and they can all be killed. Then the king took a signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadath, the, Agag the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the silver is yours and the people also to do with them as you please. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the month. And it was <clears throat> written just as Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who are over each province and to the princes of each people, each province according to its script, each people according to its language, being written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to seize their, their possessions as plunder. A copy of the edict will be issued as law in every province was published to all the people so that they should be ready for this day. The couriers went out impelled by the king's command while the decree was issued at the citadel in Susa. And while the king and Haman sat down to drink, the city of Susa was, was in confusion. So, okay. More evidence that this is just a bizarrely unjust, nonsensical edict. And also, it's just kind of like, this just plays on the worst, uh, you know, impulses in humans right here, because it's basically saying, look, uh, on this day, it's going to be the rule that everybody just needs to kill these people. Um, you know, in, in this era, you could probably <laughs> make an argument that there, there might be some desire, like, like the Haman of today would be like, we need an edict to kill all of the straight white male because they're causing so much destruction and, and, and challenge and they just rebel against what is good and true. And um, you know, that's, that's the kind of just, just edict this is, right? And then the, the incentive here is, oh, and when you kill them, you get to seize all their possessions as plunder. So you get to see all their stuff and it's legal. And um, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bring up something of a, um, <clears throat> of uh, a generalization, but, you know, the Jewish people have always tended to be quite um, industrious and they have a tendency to be wealthy, you know, because of that. And it's, it's almost part of their culture in a way. Like if you, you know, just sit down with a, a lot of Jewish communities, there is a lot of business, business acumen and, um, you know, just general wealth. So in a sense, it's like, there's a likelihood that people, you know, this, this played into people's envy, jealousy. Um, what's the word? Uh, it's one of the 10 commandments. Um, Thou shalt not uh, covet, right? And so there's just so much ugliness in this law. And so it's good to keep that in mind as we're reading this, how, how this is just such a messed up system that Haman has kind of, uh, <clears throat> precipitated through his prideful, you know, self-will. Anyway, continuing on. Chapter four. Esther learns of Haman's plot. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. Then Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, and the, the queen writhed in great anguish, and she sent garments to clothe Mordecai that he might remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, from the king's eunuchs whom the king had appointed to attend her and ordered him to go to king or go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. So Hathak went out to Mordecai to the city square in the front of the king's gate. 
Mordecai told all that they had ha all that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict, which had been issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and to plead with him for her people. Hathak came back and related Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Thak and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king in the to the into the to the king to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law that they that he be put to death. Unless the king holds out the golden scepter so that they may live, and I have not been summoned to the king for these 30 days. They related Esther's words to Mordecai. And I was thinking about this, as Dean was mentioning earlier, the whole fear thing, right? That we need to overcome Mr. Fear because he wants to keep us trapped. And this is an interesting thing. And, and it's even more uh, just evidence of, of how broken of a governmental system there was here, where if you go in to see the king and you haven't been summoned, the default is you die. <laughs> unless the king changes his mind on you and, and likes to see you. And by the sounds of it, Esther, the prize trophy wife of the king, whom he chose out of everybody, she hasn't seen him for 30 days and she's afraid she'll be killed if she goes into his presence without being summoned. So of all people in the entire world, um, you'd think she'd be the least afraid of this, right? But then we have the history of Vashti and how she was just a nobody to him if she didn't obey his command, right? And um, so you can see, again, this king probably isn't a really awesome dude. He's probably not the most righteous person, leader. He's probably a little bit, um, you know, uh, I'm failing the word, but you know, anyway, not a great guy. <clears throat> so then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you are in the king's, that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. So everybody knows this is kind of like, you know, the, the John 316 passage of Esther, like that, that inflection point of like, this is why everything has happened this way for this moment for you to do this thing. And she has to overcome her fear, right? Um, and so I, I just want to, you know, drop that seed in all of our minds in this moment, because, you know, yes, Esther is special, but who else is special? all of God's children, right? And so God has this sort of thing going on in each of our lives in our own way that we need to be ready to face up to when that moment of fear or uh, resistance comes for us to do something that is potentially um, impactful, but a little bit unnerving, right? So Esther plans to intercede. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go assemble all the Jews who are found at Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens will also fast in the same way. And thus I will go to the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded. So this is great. You can see that Esther is a person who is, you know, has conscience towards God in a serious way because she didn't just say, okay, fine, I'll do it. She, you could tell they're still like, this is, this is the epitome of courage right here is because you can tell there's still fear because she requested spiritual assistance, right? She requested that everybody in the whole city pray and fast for her for three days straight and just all of their energy going to this, no eating or drinking for three days. Did I? Yeah, no drinking, crazy. <clears throat> and, um, and they'll fast too. And if that 
fails to tip the scales spiritually in her favor, then okay, I'm going to die, right? That's a good um, model for us, right? You know, if there's something difficult we need to do that's frightening and scary, but it's the right thing, let's, let's put on some spiritual disciplines to prepare our hearts and minds for the difficult, frightening thing and then do it rather than just be cavalier about it or not do it, right? Build our confidence that way. So Esther plans a banquet. So it's not spoken of this way, but it's clear that she had a plan. It's clear that there was some sort of inspiration given. We don't know how it came about, whether it's something she privately received or thought of and kept it to herself or whether Mordecai and her kind of talked to us back and forth. But she came up like the prayers and the fasting, it worked. A plan was given because here it is, the plan begins, right? Now it came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's rooms. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. When the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. So Esther came near and touched the top of the scepter. So she got through that barricade. She's not going to die. Praise the Lord. And then here's where things happen, right? Then the king said to her, what is troubling you, Queen Esther? And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be given to you. This is great. Esther said, if it pleases the king, may the king and Haman come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly that we may do as Esther desires. So the king and Haman came to the banquet, which Esther had prepared. As they drank their wine at the banquet, the king said to Esther, what is your petition? For it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be done. So Esther replied, my petition and my request is, if you found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and do it, what I request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king say, king says. So here's the thing, right? Like reading between the lines, Esther's got this plan and this plan is to butter people up because she knows this is how this government works <laughs> is it doesn't work by morality and justice and reason and logic. It works by greasing the wheels, having, having creating affinities between people and, and things of that nature, right? So she's, she's playing into that and doing it very smartly. And she's doing it in a way that is going to set up the king and set up Haman in certain ways that play into their favor. So here we go. And we're going to learn exactly how Haman is just the example of what we read in the New Testament about pride, right? Before pride comes the fall. I don't, I don't remember if that's in that Psalms, but regardless, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're prideful, you will be brought low. If you are humble, you will be raised up, right? <clears throat> then Haman went out of that day glad and pleased of heart, but when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate and that he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. Haman controlled himself, however, went to his house and sent for his friends and his wife Suresh. Then Haman recounted to them the glory of his riches and the number of his sons in every instance when the king has magnified him and how he promoted him above the princes and servants of the king. He's got all this great stuff going for him, but gosh, that one guy Mordecai won't give him the honor he deserves and therefore his life sucks. Haman also said, <clears throat> even Esther, the queen, let no one but me come to the king, <laughs> the king to the banquet she had prepared. And tomorrow I am also invited with her, to, by, invited by her with the king. Yet all of this does not satisfy me every time I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. Then Zeresh, his wife, and all, her fr all his friends said to him, have a gallows 50 cubits high made. In the morning, ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And the advice pleased him, and so he had the gallows made. These are great people, you know? <laughs> oh, you don't, oh, that guy, your life basically has every glory you can think of imaginable to it. But that one stupid guy, yeah, he's a jerk. I can't believe he doesn't honor you. Just kill him and kill him in this glorious, obvious way that, that makes it, you know, uh, really obvious to everybody around that you don't want to go against Haman because he's such a cool guy. Great idea. I like it. Let's do that. Um, so... <clears throat> But little does he know, this plan that uh, was inspired in, in Esther by whatever means that God had, you know, ordered, um, it's not going to work in his favor, right? 
during that night, the king could not sleep. Can we, can we recall other times like Joseph and, um, and Daniel's life where God acts through dreams or acts through sleep being disturbed? It's always a, a marker. So another lesson to learn, if you cannot sleep and it's not, and it's something that's got you thinking, you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, and you're, you're having trouble, take a moment, seek the Lord, you know, do a uh, Samuel, like, what's going on here, Father, you know, is there a reason, and see if there's some sort of inspiration that needs to come to you in the night, and if it's for purpose, and not just some simple, oh, I need sleep, and I'm not getting it, and get all grumpy, because who knows, God might be working, right, so <clears throat> during that night, the king could not sleep, so he gave an order to bring the book of records, the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. So he's like, okay, let's just get, can you just read me the most boring thing, dry thing ever so I could fall asleep to this? <laughs> it was found written when Mordecai had reported <clears throat> concerning Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on the king. And king, the king said, what honor her dignity has been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? Then the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done. So the king said, who is in the court? <laughs> now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows, which he had prepared for him. The king's servant said, behold, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So remember, remember how this government works. It's, it's a, a honor culture. It's a glorify culture. It's one of how can we make people uh, seem so special if they've done any good thing that, that you know, promotes and self undulates the system itself and the order itself rather than they just did something good, right? So a great honor has been done to the king and it wasn't repaid. So it must be repaid because that is how it works. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? <clears throat> so Haman came in and the king said to him, what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said to himself, having been buttered up by these recent events, you know, that Esther was a part of, he's the most special man in all the kingdom aside from the king himself. <clears throat> whom would the king desire to honor more than me? It must be me he's talking about. Oh, I'm going to do the, all my dreams are going to come true just now. Then Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king desires to honor, let them bring a royal robe, which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble princes, and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor, and lead him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, thus it shall be done to the man who the king desires to honor. The king said to Haman, Take quickly your robes and the horse of you as said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate, and do not fall short in anything that you of all of you that you have said. <laughs> and he, you know, you're you're the guy, you're the top prince that is to do this <laughs> for him. <laughs> so Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback to the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. You can just picture the um, consternation and disgust within him in having to carry out this task. But this is how the system works. He can't defy the king. He's got to do it, right? Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home mourning with his head covered. Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him, the humiliation. Then his wise man and then his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, if Mordecai whom before you have begun to fall is of Jewish origin, you will not overcome him, but surely fail, fall before him. While they were still talking to him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hastily brought Haman to the banquet, which Esther had prepared. Tides have turned for him. All right, Esther's plea. So now the king and Haman came to drink wine with Esther the queen. And the king said to Esther on the second day also, <clears throat> as they drank their wine at the banquet, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Queen Esther replied, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me as my, peti my petition and my people as my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Now, if we had only been as slaves, 
men and women, I would have remained silent, for trouble would be not commensurate with the annoyance to the king. Then King Ahasuerus asked Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who would presume to do thus? Esther said, a foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman became terrified before the king and queen. <laughs> well, what a situation for the guy. Oh my gosh, you can just imagine his face turned completely white. <laughs> oh my word. The king arose in his anger from drinking wine and went into the palace garden. Oh wow, she must have been also being rather generous with the wine at this meal, knowing that the king can act a little bit rashly, just like how things happened with Vashti, if he's got a little bit of extra wine in him, right? And went into the palace garden. So he, you know, stomped off angry. Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, and he saw that harm had been determined against him by the king. Now, when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, will he even assault the queen with me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. You know, you can just imagine like an action movie where the guy is being taken to his end. <clears throat> then Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were, who were before the king said, Behold, indeed, the gallows stand at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. Such poetic justice. Um, that God is able to orchestrate in a corrupt and broken system. <laughs> All right, Mordecai promoted, on that day, King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther, and Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had disclosed what he was to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had taken away from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther set Mordecai, Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king, fell at his feet, wept, and implored him to avert the evil scheme of Haman the Agagite and his plot, which he devised against the Jews. The king extended the golden scepter to Esther. So Esther arose, stood before the king. Then she said, if it pleases the king, and I have found favor before him, and the matter seems proper to the king, and I am pleasing in his sight, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are on all the king's provinces. How can I endure to see such the calam to see <clears throat> the calamity which will befall my people? And how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? So King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, behold, I have given the house of Haman to Esther and him they have hanged on the gallows because he has stretched out his hand against the Jews. Now you write to the Jews as you see fit in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring for a decree which is written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring may not be revoked. So basically he can't undo the edict. So something else is that going to have to be uh, decreed. So the king's scribes were called at the time in the third month, that is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces, which extended from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to every province according to its script, to every people according to their language, as well as to the Jews according to their script and their language. He wrote in the king, in the name of King Ahasuerus, and sealed it with the king's signet ring, sent letters by couriers on horses, riding on steeds, sired by the royal stud, and then the king granted the Jews who were in each and every city the right to assemble and to defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate the entire army of any people or province which might attack them, including children and women, and to plunder their spoil. On one day, all of the provinces of King Ahasuerus, the 13th day of the 12th month, that is the month Adar, a copy of the edict to be issued as law in each and every province was published to all the people so that the Jews would be ready for this day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers hastened and impelled by the king's command, went out riding on the royal steeds, and the decree was given out at the citadel in Susa. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a large crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. For the Jews, there was light and gladness and joy and honor. In each and every province, in each and every city, wherever the king's commandment and his decree arrived, there was gladness and joy for the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many among the peoples of the land <clears throat> and many among the people of the land became Jews for the dread of the Jews had fallen upon them. Wow. The Jews destroy their enemies.
days. In the, now in the 12th month, that is the month Adar, on the 13th day when the king's command and edict was about to be executed on the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them. So that's an interesting thing, right? You can see there's this, there's this playing on the division in society. Again, another thing that we're aware of here in the US, there is a, you know, there's all these even talk of civil war between left and right because of how divided and different of, of views there is. And so you can see there's this reading between the lines. There's something of that. There's, there's something against the Jews that people had, you know, and because there was, there was a hope to gain mastery over them. So whatever that means, right? It was turned to the contrary so that the Jews themselves gained the mastery over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. No one could stand before them for the dread <clears throat> of them had fallen on all the peoples. Even all the princes of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and those who were doing the king's business assisted the Jews because the dread of Mordecai had fallen on them. Indeed, Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread throughout all the provinces for the man Mordecai became greater and greater. Thus the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. At the citadel in Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and Parshadatha, Delphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashta, Arisai, Aridai, and Vizatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Jews' enemy, <clears throat> but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. On that day, the number of those who were killed in Sotel and Susa were, was reported to the king. The king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman at the city of Sotel and Susa. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It shall even be granted to you. And what is your further request? Let it shall be done also. Then said Esther, if it pleases the king, let tomorrow also be granted to the Jews who are in Susa to do according to the edict of today and let Haman's 10 sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded it should be done so, and an edict was issued in Susa, and Haman's ten sons were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa assembled on, <clears throat> also on the 14th day of the month Adar and killed 300 men in Susa, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces assembled to defend their lives and rid themselves of their enemies and kill 75,000 of those who hated them, but they did, not lay, they did not lay their hands on the plunder. This was done on the 13th day of the month Adar, and on the 14th day they rested, and made, made it a day of feasting and rejoicing. But the Jews who were in Susa assembled on the 13th and 14th of the same month, and they rested in the 15th day and made it a day of feasting and rejoicing. Therefore, the Jews of the rural areas who lived in the rural towns made the 14th day of the month Adar a holiday for rejoicing and feasting and sending portions of food to one another. So the Feast of Purim was instituted. Then Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Hazarus, both near and far, obliging them to celebrate the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same month annually. Because of those days, on those days, the Jews ridded themselves of their enemies, and it was a month which was turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into holiday, that they should make <clears throat> them days of feasting, rejoicing, and sending portions of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Thus the Jews undertook what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them, for Haman, the son of Hamadath of the Agagite, the adversary of all the Jews, had schemed against the Jews to destroy them and cast purr, that is a lot, to, destroy, to disturb them and destroy them. And when it came to the king's attention, he commanded by letter that his wicked scheme, which he had devised against the Jews, should return on his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore they called those days, these days, Purim after the name of Purr. And because of the instructions of this letter, both what they and had seen in this regard and what had happened to them, the Jews established and made a custom for themselves and for their descendants and for all those who had allied themselves with them so that they would not fail to celebrate these two days according to their regulation and according to their appointed time annually. So these days are to be remembered, celebrated throughout every generation, every family, every province and every city. And these days of Purim were not to fail among the Jews or their memory fade from their descendants then Queen Esther, daughter of Abihel, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. He sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely words of peace and truth, to establish these days of Purim at their appointed times, just as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had established for them, and just as they had established for themselves and for their descendants with instructions for the times of feasting, fasting, and their lamentations. The command of Esther established these customs for Purim, and it was written in the book. 
Can, now King Ahasuerus laid a tribute on the land and on the coastlines of the sea and all the accomplishments of his authority and strength and the full account of, of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the books of the Chronicles, the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second only to King Ahasuerus and great among the Jews and in favor with many of his kinsmen, one who sought the good of his people and one who spoke for the welfare of his whole nation. All right, we got through it all. <sighs> um, so let's see, I'm just gonna go back to the video here. I just wanted to impress upon us, you know, cause it's that time, like this is when this is celebrated. The Jews of our current age all just celebrated this a couple days ago. And I see no problem with Christians also celebrating this because in a way it is our heritage too, as believers in the same God, right? And, um, and it just is, is such a glorious reminder that God works in our lives despite systems around us having no regard for him, right? And those of you who have listened to me go through the Joseph story, go through the Daniel story, this is a theme that recurs in scripture that governments don't need to be in alignment with God's ways for God to prevail in God's people's lives, right? Which is super encouraging to me because I am very not in favor of <laughs> the way our governments operate 99% of the time. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that you know, this is a big, huge, great, great glorious thing that created an, an annual custom and celebration, but God does these types of things in our lives in, in different scales, you know, throughout our lives, right? And I did want to share a couple of stories because these things happened right before and right after Purim in my life, and, um, and now Rosalind's on, so there's two people on that uh, it relates to, um, <clears throat> but uh I wish Indy was here. Anyway, um, I want to share those stories with you guys just as kind of personal examples of how I feel like God does this nowadays, even in little things, right? And so it ties back as well to what John was sharing last Sunday because he was talking about discussing matters of the Trinity versus the Unitarian perspective with people and how to do that in the Christian realm. And so the first story I wanted to share with you guys was um, it was a week ago. I can't remember if it was a week or if it was Saturday. I think it was a week ago after church. I was just working all day because my life is just super crazy mania right now. And I just work 24 seven, it feels like, but um, except for Saturdays when I can't, because I just crash. <laughs> but anyway, um, I get a call from Inti and it's like, uh, like three o'clock or something. And he's like, Jackson, I'm just struggling right now. I really need to talk to someone and ask some questions. And I was like, yeah, 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 let's, let's talk. Um, you know, I had just made plans to take Zoe to the grocery store with me because I had to run to the post office, drop off some packages. And um, so it had to be Saturday. It couldn't have been Sunday because I wouldn't do that on Sunday. Anyway, um, so I was like, yeah, 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 that's fine. And then I talked to Hannah and I'm like, you know, I need to talk to Inti, um, but it's not really going to work to bring Zoe with me because she's just going to be in the back of the car or be walking around at the grocery store with me and I'm not gonna be able to give her attention and it's not gonna be fun and and I was like torn because I'm like well what's the right thing to do should I keep this promise with my daughter or should I you know be spend time with Inti because he needs it right and Hannah thankfully was just like you be with Inti I'll take care of Zoe she doesn't she doesn't need that and, and I was like okay okay so she relieved my conscience and I was just and you know she dealt with whatever disruption that created in her life. And um, I gave Inti a call and we chatted and I helped him kind of, you know, straighten out some things in his head about some ideas. And it was just interesting because how all this resulted was, um, I'm, I'm a very logistically efficiency type person. I, I delivered dry cleaning and picked up dry cleaning for almost 10 years and on a route and you have to like be super efficient and plan everything out and do it in the most, uh, time efficient way possible and so that has still sticks with me and going to UPS going to the post office and going to the grocery store is something I would normally do in the most efficient way possible as well um, but because I was on the phone with Inti and kind of half distracted 
I did this weird zigzag pattern where I drove in one direction and then past the grocery store and drove in another direction and then drove back to the grocery store and um, ended up being a lot more time consuming than it needed to be. But how it ended up working is I'm on, I'm on the phone with Inti this whole time and we're just chatting away and enjoying our conversation, laughing and whatnot. And um, I get to the grocery store and for those of you who are, you know, have been known what's going on with me and Hannah for the last, you know, eight months or whatever, back in the summertime, we got connected with a girl named Brittany, who, um, uh, who we, we kind of connected with. And um, we knew right after that, we need to be honest that we're not Trinitarian and, you know, like, you know, just, just know that about us. Right. And um she broke it off with us uh, like right before Christmas for that reason. It was like, you know, uh, seems clear to us in scripture that God, Jesus is God. And, you know, so we're just going to break off fellowship and I don't, I don't think we should be hanging out anymore. And we're like, all right, all right. And, you know, like, I don't think it was handled correctly, but it's just a messy situation. Right. And so lo and behold, She's at the grocery store <laughs> while I'm there on the phone with Inti and just these weird little details. Like I, I have to tell you guys these weird details because they're, they're so strangely intricately interesting. Um, if you can imagine this grocery store, right? So I'm going to position this for you guys. Hopefully this is on your left side, but um, it starts off, you enter in and this is like all the produce and then like the freezer aisle, the dairy and whatnot. And I just do the loop around the edge and then I'll grab whatever from the aisles that I need afterwards. So normally I would just like walk straight up, but I was again, still distracted on the phone. So I was just kind of like meandering around, not like really looking at what I was doing. I was just like walking around the grocery store, talking to empty. And so I go through the produce and then I turn right and then I go up one of the aisles and then I come back and then I go through there and then I walk up to the edge of the, the corner of the grocery store and then I hear something and I look behind me and it's Brittany and her kids because I can recognize the noise. They like were like family with us for several months over here for dinner all the time. And I was just it was just so bizarre that I happened to like walk exactly around them <laughs> without even thinking. And then I go and I'm like, what the heck? They're here. And, um, you know, hadn't seen her for months. And uh, I was still on the phone with Indy, so I wasn't going to go and say hi or anything. I was just carrying on my business. And I'm like, whatever, we'll cross paths if we, if we need to. And um, so, you know, I was like maybe three quarters done filling up my basket with stuff we needed. And then we run into each other at one intersection of, of the hallways. And uh, I'm still on the phone with Indy, so we didn't really communicate much. But it was one of those moments. It was one of those awkward moments. Like, we've all experienced this in some way, shape, or form. But it had that, that air of like, you know, a bad breakup with like a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something where it was like, I have no hard feelings. I'm not like, whatever it is what it is. But that the facial expression on her was like, <laughs> what are you doing here kind of thing, right? And, um, and I was like, hey, how's it going, right? And, but I was still talking to Auntie, so I was just, it was kind of a wave and a smile and I walked away and she was kind of like awkwardly like, hi, what are you, don't, don't come near me kind of thing, right? And, um, so carried on, whatever. And I eventually wrapped up the uh, call with NT and, and we said bye. And, and I was like getting ready to go to the checkout. And as I'm going to the checkout, I, I walk past her again at, at a different checkout line and I'm not on the phone. So I'm just like, hey, good to see you. And she's like, yeah, good to see you too. And, you know, kind of, you know, whether or not she fully meant it or not, but it was like pleasantry type stuff. You know what I mean? And she was there with her kids, all the stuff, big shopping trip. I just had a little basket of things. And um, again, it's just these, these weird timing things. I go to the checkout and under normal circumstances, I would have checked out faster than her left and been gone. Right. And maybe would have like said something in passing as I walked past her finishing up. But what happened is Zoe has been doing these uh, exercise things that like teach her um, like the beginning and ending sounds of, of words it's just amazing. I can't even believe how well she can read already. It's crazy. But um, what we've been doing is there are these fun little exercises and we give her a piece of chocolate when you know she gets one hundred percent. So I had to I had to restock on some chocolate and I forgot. So I run back up to this other part of the grocery store to grab the chocolate, then go back to the checkout. And by that time, uh, Brittany had already checked out. 
So she was gone. So I'm finishing up. But then the timing of it was exactly such that as I'm walking out the door, she's pushing her cart back into the grocery store. And we just like right in front of the door of the grocery store are like right there. And it's like, I'm like, hey, how are things going? <laughs> and, just, and it went from like, who are you? What are you doing here? I don't want to talk to you kind of thing to she just like resumed normal in a way and just kind of gave me the full update. We talked about all sorts of stuff. She's going to move back to Alabama and all these different things going on. And it was just this weird, like complete shift of back to normal, you know, and, and part of me, like, I don't know what all that accomplished in the spiritual realm. Like, I know it was good for me because it was nice to be like, have a pleasant finish rather than like this awkward, ugly, not of God kind of finish to the relationship. But in a way, I kind of imagine it was probably super beneficial for her too, because it was like, you couldn't come away from that conversation thinking I had anything against her or, you know, hard feelings when, as I'm sure she's reflected on it, she probably knows she didn't really act right in that whole situation. So in a way, it's almost like, it's like the slate has been cleaned in a sense. And it's just weird, like the timing of that, like, I was just going to get on a phone call with Inti, but there was this like tension between, well, should I spend time with my daughter like I promised and leave Inti hanging or should I call Inti? And, and then the randomness of all these things just happening and timing out in such a way that it creates this happy conclusion to a messy thing that happened months ago. And it's just so interesting. And it's like, God will work that lot up. I could never plan that. You know what I mean? It was just like, God was at work unbeknownst to me. And I just went ahead with something where I listened to the advice of somebody else, even though I have my own, uh, you know, moral consternation about it and did the thing I was told by my wife and it all worked out, right? Kind of like how Esther listened to Mordecai. And then uh, just a smaller example, and this involves Josiah and Rosalind here. This just happened like, like 12 hours ago. Um, I had a date with uh, Josiah to talk because we've been trying to stay in touch once a week and it was going to be at 8.30 my time. But uh, Rosalind and Hannah and I have kind of an ongoing polo where we kind of keep up, up to date and touch as best we can. It's not, not always <laughs> very, very in touch, but, um, but I had finally caught up on the last message Rosalind had sent. And it, the message was going to, I was going to finish listening to it like literally the minute I needed to call Josiah for our little call date. Right. And I, and as I'm listening to her message, I'm like, oh man, I really wish I could reply right now. Cause all this stuff is like fresh in my mind and there's things I want to say. And it's just the, the littlest thing, but like at that last minute, like 30 seconds left of the message, I get a text message from Josiah and he says, hey, can, can we call 15 minutes later? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> and so I immediately finish the message and then hop on my polo and start going for a walk. And I get to reply fully everything I wanted to say back to Rosalind. And then right then I could call Josiah. It's just this, such a little thing, but it's like, I love it when God does these little things that, um, you know, just make things happen. So it was really cool. And um, just wanted to share all that in light of the holiday that recently passed, in light of everything that happened with Esther and Mordecai and Haman and King Ahasuerus and the whole 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia of that era. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, just contemplate that and we can talk about it and maybe share some stories and maybe share some hopes of what God might do in our lives. And uh, if you are somebody who wants to join us and discuss things like this in the future, um, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, join us at a2kchurch.org or visit us at allegiance to the king.org and reach out. We'd love to have you join, hear your thoughts and uh, fellowship with you. So God bless. <laughs>